any better than I know myself, and you've known me longer than anyone else. Such knowledge is too wonderful. Stand it. Such knowledge is too wonderful. Good morning. I can't even comprehend. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Sorry it was on that time. Yeah, come on in and take a seat. Those people that are out there in the foyer, come on in. Something a little bit different today. We're not doing any worship. Uh, we have a special treat for you today. You know, Pastor Greg is on vacation. That part's not the special treat, but the special <laughs> treat is, is this part here. Um, he's on his 28th uh, wedding anniversary, so we've just been praying for him all week. And praise the Lord that 28 years, what an accomplishment. That's very, very cool. So, um, I just have a couple quick announcements for you today, and um, one of them is that if you have a baby bottle that you've got for the coins for LifeNet, go ahead and get that back. We need it turned in by the 20th, which is next Sunday. So, um, turn that back in. If you don't have coins to fill it, that's okay. They spend paper money just as good as they spend coins. They even take checks. So... Get that bottle filled and get it turned back in. There's also a men's breakfast next Saturday. So next Saturday at 8 o'clock, uh, come on in. And the breakfast doesn't cost anything. The sign-up is at the connection counter. So men, um, I'm looking at all you men on this side and in the middle and over here. So men, come on in and have a breakfast. Um, and then it's going to be followed... It's okay, it's, they've got a little smoke back there, but you're safe. <laughs> you're safe. Um, and then the, the last um, announcement I have is that there's home groups starting the 4th of July. There's sign-ups at the connection counter, and so the, it's actually going to start on the 4th of July. So get signed up if you're one of the leaders or if you're one of just the, the participants. And if you have more questions, you can see Bill Mendenhall. So for, for right now, Let's just fellowship for a couple minutes, take a couple minutes and greet each other, and then we'll get started. All right, thank you. I can shout pretty well. There we go. This is really cool because you can sound like the Lord. 
If your wedding was anything like that, please come see me for counseling afterwards. <laughs> My name is Jay McCarl, and I want to show you a Galilean wedding. Uh, it's a wedding that, well, it's in the Bible. It's in the New Testament especially. The interesting thing is that it shows up in part, not Galilean, but just an ancient Jewish wedding, in the Old Testament too. Not just because it's a wedding, but because weddings were something that God wanted people to have in mind was something very, very important that he brought to this world. You see, well, God, listen to me, this is very important. God, are you listening? God is always wanting to bring people in. In our politically charged atmosphere of today, we're pushing people away and pushing people out. God is always bringing people in. And when it comes to the end of the world and the things of the end of the world, God wants people to be brought in. He doesn't want anyone to be left out. Well, it's really bad news when you read the Bible for those that are rebelling against God and raising their fist to Him. But God never stops trying to woo people into His kingdom because He loves you so much. God so loved the world. And so he explains that when he talks about the end of the world, when his disciples ask him, what is it going to be like when you're coming? Yeah, he gives them all kinds of wrath of God things. But then he brings it down to something different. It's going to be like a wedding. And he did this because that's the way these people thought. They didn't abstract well. When we talk about the Bible, we give all kinds of abstractions. These people couldn't do that. So what he did is he gave them the truth with handles on it so they could carry it anywhere they went. And with the wedding being like the end of the world and the end of the world being like a wedding, as described in the Bible, it was carried by the apostles throughout the Roman Empire. And it not only shows up in Judea, but you see it showing up in Corinth, and in Athens, and in, in Thessalonica, and in the book of Revelation, over and over and over again. I want to show you what this was like. Well, you've already seen, this is the wedding processional here that just came up, except in real life it would have been a lot longer. It would have been maybe a hundred people or more. And you can imagine the obnoxious noise, and it wouldn't have stopped after 15 seconds. It would have gone on for about a half an hour or more. And I'll explain that in just a minute. But meanwhile, I want to just to take you, let's start at the beginning. How did we arrive at this? A wedding feast held in a secluded compound where the gates are shut, nobody leaves, nobody enters, and the people are feasting and having a marvelous time. How did we get here? It's actually quite simple, except it started a long time ago. You see, back in those days, weddings were almost universally arranged marriages. We don't do that here very much unless you're part of a, a special uh, uh, ethnic group that may have come in from a particular place in the world that that's, does that sort of celebration. That's fine if that's what's done. But we don't do it in America very much. But the rest of the world does it all the time. And these people did it all the time. It was considered honorable and it was considered good because they were not individualists. We are rugged individualists as Americans and we make our own choices. Family made choices for you and you weren't an individual, you were an extension of the family. And you got to think of it that way. And that way you've got to put people together that are going to work with your family and benefit the family and bring honor to the family. How would that happen? Well, it could have happened in a million different ways, but let me give you the simplest scenario and also sort of an idealistic one where you don't have deaths in the family occurring or whatever. It's a nice, nice, clean version. I, I'm a papa, and I have a little son who is about five years old. And I'm a merchant, and I'm in my own village, and I'm going about my business, and I'm whatever it is that I do as a trade or as a business, and I'm talking to somebody, and we're, we're, we're haggling back and forth about something because that's what I do. And then I, and I hear children laughing behind me, and they're giggling, and they're laughing, and I look around, there's children. I like children. There's children. They're laughing. They're having fun. And I, I, Whose little girl is that? There's this little girl down there. She's very healthy. She's pretty, yes, but that really doesn't count because pretty and love really didn't matter much when you did an arranged marriage. 
What mattered was the family. Were they honorable? Were they going to bring something to your family? Were you going to bring something to theirs because you are binding them together? And you look at the little girl, she looks healthy. She looks very, uh, very studious. And, and, and I just heard her dad shout at her, and she responded respectfully. She's very respectful. She's honorable. She's only three years old, but I think she would make a great bride for my little boy. You say, that's really perverted. <laughs> I'm, this is what you're thinking, isn't it? Sorry to use that terrible word on a Sunday morning, but it's true. But the thing is, people would get their children together. They would make arrangements to engage them at very young ages, lest they be taken by somebody else later on. And so I look at the little girl and I say, I've got to find out who her father is. They tell me, oh, I know who he is. <coughs> I've done business with him before. So I go home and I set up a table, not unlike this one, just not quite this fancy, but it's very nice. And it's called a triclinium table. It's where very special, wealthy-type feasts take place, and you honor your guests with such a table. And I get as much food as I can, and I get the family ready because I tell them, we're going to try and get my little son, Judah, engaged. And, and then I send my brother, because we all live in the same compound. I send him over to the little girl's house. And he pounds on the door, bam, 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 bam. And he says, I have a gospel, I have a gospel. What do you mean you have a gospel? Gospel was a word that they used before the message of Christ was ever attached to it. It meant a message. This will change your whole view of sharing the gospel. It was a message that had absolutely no bad news. It was all good. Can you imagine back in those days, almost every message had bad news in it. It was a really savage world. This is a message with only good news. I have a gospel. Well, of course, the father comes running to the door. What have you got? And he said, my brother has asked you to come to his house. He would like to have a feast with you. He knows what's going on. And he walks out the door, and he goes over to my house. And I usher him in with all the formalities and the hospitality, and he sits down at the table, and I wine and dine him for a couple of days. Yeah, he doesn't go home for a couple of days. They don't have clocks back then. Are you kidding me? They just do things that way. And finally, when I think it's ready, the time has come, I pop the question. How about your little girl becoming engaged to my son, that they one day might become betrothed? And if he agrees, and he agrees, then I call in a scribe, somebody who can read and write. And most people back then couldn't, despite the fact you may have heard otherwise, most people could not read and write even among the Hebrews, though they were the most literate people in the world, for sure. And the scribe comes in, and now we begin to haggle about the terms of the marriage and about what the bridegroom is going to be to the bride and what the bride's going to be to the bridegroom. He's five, she's three. Are you kidding me? It doesn't matter because this is their future that we're scribing down. And the scribe makes two identical copies. They could write it on a piece of a clay. They could write it on a piece of wood. They could scratch it into a stone. They could write it on leather. Uh, they begin to write things like, well, here's one here. Look at this. This you can barely see. This is a clay tablet. It's a replica. But it's written in cuneiform. This thing is 3,900 years old. And it's the type of deal that's made between a bride and a groom by the papas before they're ever married. That's the type of thing that they have. Now, as they're doing this, uh, we're haggling back and forth. We're haggling about, first of all, how much for the bride? Because the papa of the bridegroom has to buy the bride. And they decide on 10 camels and two donkeys and a flock of goats after haggling it down from some absurd number. And finally, when that's established, the scribe writes it down in duplicate on both copies. And it's word for word. And then we talk about the bride's dowry. She's got to have a dowry. She's got a fortune that she's supposed to bring in, even if she's like really, really poor that she's got to bring something into the marriage. And the reason why is that even though her own family keeps these things on deposit, whether it's money, whether it's furniture or possessions, whether it's something else or a combination of all the above, it's written down because if something happens to the bridegroom or if he deserts her, she's on her own. And please forgive me, I'm going to use a couple of mature terms while I'm talking today, but she would be considered, forgive me, damaged goods. And she's unlikely to ever get married again if the bridegroom deserts her or if something happens to the bridegroom. So her fortune is her welfare. It takes care of her if something happens to him. And so that's put in there. Also, other things would be put in there. Other th what, what he would do for a living for the rest of his life. He's going to be this way. And what she's going to do for him. And perhaps even, and this has been found in ancient ancient contracts that they put together. They called them ketubahs, by the way, a ketubah, or you might have heard it ketubah. That's sort of a Yiddish version of it, ketubah. 
And that's a covenant, and it's being written down. And as it's being written down, it might even include how many children she's going to have and of which gender. Yeah, how do you do that? But it might be in there. For instance, when Sarah and people, the women back then, couldn't have children, it was considered a disgrace. But for married women who could not have children, it was considered also a breach of contract and therefore dishonorable, you see, because it was all written down. Well, we put all of these things into this ketubah, into this contract, into this covenant, and it's all written down. And when we finally are done with the haggling, then the scribe reads back both copies to make sure that nothing was missed. And then one copy is given to the father of the bridegroom, and one copy is given to the father of the bride. And then they stand up at the end of the feast, and they give each other a holy kiss and shalom each other. And off goes the father of the bride back to his house with his ketubah in hand. And there, both of these men take this this very, very precious covenant, and each of them put it in their own family safe, which is sort of like a shrine where they keep all the kosher plates and, and ceremonial cups, and they put it in there, and they leave it in there until the day when the bride and the groom, they are going to be betrothed together, when they're at the ripe old age of 13 or 14 years old. You say, boy, that, that's, that's terrible. Imagine you with kids, the distress that you would avoid if you got them married off that early. Hmm. <laughs> Teenagers are going, oh, no, yeah, all right, your parents are thinking that right now, so beware. <laughs> right? Right, okay, yeah. So my, my cast back here, they're great. But uh, so, so the, the purchase price of the bride, it's in the ketchup. Oh, by the way, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, right at the end of the chapter, Paul goes through this list of terrible sins and things that people tend to do. But he said, remember, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. He's not talking about slavery. He's talking about a bride being bought by a bridegroom. That's the context of what's going on there. Paul understood this. It shows up right there for the very first time. Oh, and then, after, after a number of years, again, 13 or 14 years old, so now it's about 10 years later, one of the papas pulls out the ketubah and reads it and says, it's time to do this. Let's have a betrothal and let's get these people on the road to marriage. So he sends messengers back and forth to the bride's house and there they begin to make preparations and they choose a day. They don't get their calendars out and try and figure it out on that modern little glass block that you carry around with you and, and the alarms go off. They have to decide, well, let's do this like three days after the next Sabbath because it's going to be a good day that day. And let's do that. And so that morning, the families have put together a parade. They put together all kinds of fun, marvelous noisemakers, excellent things that they're going to, to use to make all kinds of celebration with the bride and the groom that day. They wake the bride and the groom up very early in that morning and they get them dressed in the best clothes that they have. Well, it's not like they're going to go to a closet. You realize these people, unless they were very, very rich, only had one change of clothes. So if they're going to dress up a bride, they're going to use clothes from different people and layer it on her. She's going to be borrowing the best she can find. Same thing for the bridegroom, because 85% of the people back then were so poor, they ate maybe every other day one meal. That's how poor people could have been back in those days. You can imagine their clothing and how bad it would have been. How do you replace it? That's why when you read the Bible, you see in the Bible that clothing is almost an economy, you, especially in the Old Testament. Somebody gives Samson all these changes of clothes. Why? It sounds ridiculous. Where are you going to get them otherwise? See, that's the way it was. So on that morning, they wake up the bride, the girls. They all wake up the bride. They dress her. They give her some good heavy food. The same thing with the bridegroom at his house, and they dress him up as best they can, and they give him some good heavy food because it's going to have to last a while. And the first thing they do is they go off to a, the synagogue, or if they're in Jerusalem, over by the temple, and they dunk in a mikvah. This is a way to set yourself apart wholly to God. There's a whole story behind this I wish I could tell you today because it relates even to baptism and how it evolved into that. But it was a ceremonial cleansing where you would just dunk in this pool and come out and you were like a brand new person before God because you're about to begin a brand new life that day. And then, of course, the bride and groom do it separately from each other. They're not allowed to see each other the day of their betrothal. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? I wonder if this is where it came from. And then they go back to their houses, and now a parade is put together of the whole family. And they have noisemakers and drums. They have kalils. What's a kalil? 
It's a, it's, it's, it's a little flute that sounds like somebody's strangling a cat. It's just absolutely a nasty little thing. Unless you're from the Middle East and then you love it. I have never gotten used to it, but people in the Middle East just thrive on Khalils. They love it. And drums and all kinds of things. That horn that I was blowing, a shofar here. This is a ram's horn trumpet, and it's a real one from Israel. But uh, it makes all kinds of horrendous noises when you hear about trumpets in the Bible. They sound more like, you know, something bellowing rather than a nice clear horn sound. That, that's what that is. And, and then they get ready to, to go to make the betrothal because it's a very, very important formal ceremony that they're going to be going through. And they have to do it at a very special place for a very special reason. So they get the kids ready. Now they're, it's, it, they're just, they're, they're Oh, they're dressed up and everybody's happy and they're ready for a feast and the whole thing. And, and one of the people, the papas, steps outside the house and he blows a shofar. And everybody starts cheering and yelling. Now this isn't what you just saw. This is something that's less than what you just saw. But it's a celebrating parade and the other family hears it across town, across the village, and they come out of their houses and they're doing the same thing, blowing trumpet shofars. They're playing kalils, pounding on drums, singing, dancing in the street. <laughs> they have the, the, the bride on one side, the groom on the other, coming together with the parade in the position of honor as they're dancing through the streets. Of course, the bride and the groom looking a little awkward because, remember, love and dating are not part of their lives. They're being put together against or for their will. It doesn't matter. They're coming together. That's it. And so the parades serpentine through the streets and finally come to the, to the village or city gate because there were walls around most of these places. And as they go through the gate, they have to weave their way through it. Gates aren't straight open like you see in the movies where people just go riding through. You have to make all these twists and turns. And as they go through the gate, they pass the elders. The elders are the guys who make all the legal decisions. These are like the lawyers, the judges for the people. And they're sitting at the gate. You want business done that's legal? Go to the gate. The elders of the city are there. They're the ones who are entitled to make the decisions for you when they are legal and binding. And they're sitting there. And they see this, these parades coming through. And they're going, aha, somebody is going to get betrothed. This is a legal precedent. They're going to be witnesses to it. That means that it becomes very legal. As the people press through the gates, oh, this huge crowd of two parades coming through. They go outside, and somebody finally from one of the, actually the, the, the uh, bridegroom's household, finds a spot and says, put it here. Here come four boys, and they're carrying four big long poles with some cloth wrapped around the top of it, the finest cloth they can find. And the, the man points to the ground. The boys set the poles upright, and each one grabs a pole and pulls it apart. Next thing you know, you have a canopy. It's called a hoopah. I like that word, hoopah. Fun to say, hoopah. You can say it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but you get the hoopah there, and it's this canopy. And why, why is the canopy there? Give them shade. No, some of you might have heard, well, it was a prayer shawl. They didn't have prayer shawls like that back in those days. That was a more recent development. It's the finest piece of cloth they could put up there, and what it is... It's the cloud that descended on Mount Sinai where the covenant of God with Moses and all the people of Israel was made. That's what it represents. It's the place of a covenant. And that makes it a very, very important place. And then the bride and the groom, they move under the, uh, the ketubah, under, under the, the hoopah rather, and so the ketubah can be read to all the people. All the people gather around because the parade is getting longer and longer. Why? Because the people are bored. They don't have those things. You play all these games and do all that texting or the TVs or anything else. They're just, they're going to take a break from their day. They don't have time clocks to punch out on. They just get in line. They come out because there's going to be a betrothal. This is going to be fun. And they gather around. Hey, soldiers who might be in the area, they might come and stand at a distance and watch. Even Romans, just because it would be interesting to them. You would have thieves who would stop thieving. You would have beggars who would stop begging. They would all come around. Of course, you've got the family surrounding the hoopah, and that the hoopah is the center of all the attention, and the bride and groom are under the hoopah because what the people wanted back then, unlike our weddings today, they didn't want guests. They wanted witnesses. And when you make a covenant, you need witnesses. All of you who are married, some of you have been married multiple times, it's a truth in an audience like this, that's, that's a fact, that your guests in those days were not guests, they were witnesses, that if anybody said something up in front and then they violated it later as a witness, you went after them to hold them accountable. You said, you promised, don't you wish that your guests were like that from your wedding? Some of you are going, oh no. 
But that's how it worked. And so they wanted as many witnesses as they could because whenever a declaration was made, a promise was made, a vow was made up in front, all the witnesses would shout, Amen. All the witnesses would shout, Amen. No, no, no. All the witnesses would shout, Amen. Shout. Amen. Very good. You are the witnesses today. Could I ask the bride and the groom and the father of the bride and the father of the groom to come up here? We're going to demonstrate this for you and show you what this looked like back in those days. By the way, it would have been a lot bigger, a lot more flamboyant, a lot longer. Trying to reproduce it here and now, very difficult in modern times, but you'll get the idea. So first of all, you have to pretend there's a hoopah here. I don't really bring one with me because they're a big hassle and they're hard to be able to manipulate. You've got to have people holding them up because they didn't just plant in the ground. You had people holding them. But there would be a big canopy right over the top of the bride and groom, and they're just going to stand there. Awkward because this is an arranged wedding. They haven't spent much time together. They might not even know each other very well, but they might be, well, this is okay. This is what goes on in life. This is what happens. So the first thing that happens when everybody's gathered together, all the witnesses are there, the family decides, oh, one more thing. There's no rabbi there. There doesn't need to be. There's no priest there. There doesn't need to be. It's just, just the people because you are there. You are the witnesses. You are the ones that declare things true or not true. That's why you're here as witnesses. So the, so the family begins. And the first thing that happens is that the papa of the bride and the papa of the groom, they have their ketubahs, their covenants. And they hold them up before all the people, and it is handed off to a person to publicly read. If either of these men can read, and they probably can, one of them would read it out loud. And all the terms are there, the price of the bride, the dowry, the conditions of the bridegroom, the conditions of the bride, and all the things that are on there. And they would read them out loud to all of you, and then they would look at each other, and do you accept the terms? And they do. They accept the terms. So all the witnesses shout. Amen. Ah, so now they can't go back on it. There is no point in time where one of these men could say, I didn't know that was in there. Or that wasn't supposed to be in there. When you say amen, it's final. It's done. The next thing that happens, now the price of the bride has to be formally given to the father of the bride. And so the bridegroom's father waves to his servants and they bring in the ten camels and the two donkeys and the flock of goats for the father of the bride to be able to inspect. And he looks at them, and this would take time, by the way. He would walk among the animals, he would check their teeth and everything else, make sure they're everything that was guaranteed and inspecting the animals. He agrees the animals are acceptable, the price of the bride is accepted, and you, you agree with that? And all the witnesses shout! And then, ah, the dowry. The dowry now needs to be presented. Even if it's in the form of furniture, it's paraded out in front of everyone. But in this case, we're going to have, of course, a, a bag of coins because they agreed on a certain number of coinage back in the days of the Romans, of course. And so the dowry is presented before the people and the dowry is given to the father of the bridegroom who makes sure that it's the right amount. He would count all the coins. No, you can't do it that way, but there it is. And, and is it the right amount? And it's exactly what you bargained for? And so he agrees that it's okay, and all the witnesses shout. Amen. And let me have the coins back. You don't get to keep them. There you go. Now he gets to keep them in case something happens to him. He takes care of her with that. That's how it worked back then. And so, oh, now it's neat and legal. You cannot go back on this. You cannot say it wasn't enough. You can't say the animals were bad. You can't say he slipped the one in on me. You checked and saw it, and everybody shouted. Yeah. So it's a done deal. But now everything begins to focus down right here and under the hoopah. And this is where it starts to get interesting. And this is where all those witnesses are going to lean in a little bit to what's going on because things are going to be beautiful, and they can also, at this point, go horribly wrong. The first thing that happens is the bridegroom presents the bride with a gift. There's an exchange of gifts here, and it could be something like a bracelet, it could be a necklace, it could be something else, it could be a ring, like a wedding ring, except in those days, a wedding ring would not really go on your finger, it might go on your thumb or it might go in your nose, especially if it was made out of gold. And so she has a bracelet that the bridegroom gave her. I, I just wanted to let you know something about if the situation were very, very poor, 
If these were the poorest of peasants, they are still entitled to get married and go through all the same thing. But in the case of the bridegroom, if they were extremely poor, he might present her with a coin that looked like this. This is a bronze coin that's called a pruta. It's basically a nickel back in those days. It's just a, this is a real one. This one is a Masada coin that goes back almost 2,000 years. And he would hand, if he couldn't afford any sort of a gift, he would pull out the pruta and he would show all the witnesses the pruta and then he would put it in his bride's hand. Which means, you say, not a cheapskate. It means, this is everything I have. I give it to you. Pretty good. So they, now she gives him a gift. Now we don't know what she would have given him. Ancient records of all sorts, anthropology, the whole thing, we don't know what the bride would have given the bridegroom. There is just no record of anything. So we're going to pretend that she is giving him a flask of perfume, which you don't drink. <laughs> it will make your breath smell really good and the rest of us run away. But it would be perfume, and perfume would be very appropriate because in those days of no deodorant and what have you, and it was hard to bathe back then because water was scarce, this would be for their wedding night to make things much more pleasant. And so she would give him perhaps <laughs> some perfume. But then, ah, it comes down to the crucial moment, and this is where everyone now holds their breath. The bridegroom pours some ceremonial wine into a cup. It was full-strength wine. It was fermented, and it was used for ceremonial purposes only, which means that it was only drunk by the sip, because otherwise it could make you very drunk if you drank a lot of it. It's only by the sip. So what the bridegroom does now is the ratification of this betrothal. I have to tell you something about the betrothal that I didn't mention before. A betrothal is a legal marriage. Once they do what they're about to do, the marriage is legal and binding, and yet they don't live as husband and wife for another full year. And at the end of that year, there is the wedding ceremony itself and the wedding feast at the end of that year. This is the legal marriage. Once they do what they do, the only way out is a legal divorce, even though they will not live as husband and wife for another year. So the bridegroom has poured the cup, and he extends it reverently and with great trembling, it might be, to the bride. <laughs> because as he extends it to the bride, if the bride doesn't want to marry this man, this is the only choice she has. <laughs> She's given all authority, all power at this point. <clears throat> if she doesn't want him, she can reject him. She would push the cup back at him, and the wedding is off. Well, I thought it was arranged. At this moment, she is given the choice. This is her only choice right here. <laughs> I love these guys. I'm going to take them home with me. This is the only time a bride is given a choice in the arranged marriage, and she's the only one. He can't call it off, only she can. If she doesn't want him, she pushes the cup back, rejecting him. A riot breaks out, fist fights, the hoopah goes flying, rocks go in the air, dust flies everywhere, people are tackling each other, but nobody questions her right to call off the wedding if she wants to do it. But if she wants him, she will take the cup from his hands and she will take a sip and she will give it back. What will she do? Ooh, and all the witnesses shout Amen. because there isn't going to be a fight today. <laughs> now, I'm going to pause here for just a second. They have both drank the cup, and you have shouted amen. Now they are legal. They are legally married. This is the ratification of a covenant. But here's my question to you. What's a covenant? Now, a promise? I, I, as a pastor, I've been a pastor for, well, more years than I care to state uh, since 1981. It's been a long life. So, listen, I've done a lot of premarital counseling and a lot of marriage counseling, and I find that when I do both, I always start the conversation with the same two questions. And the first question is this, what is marriage? 
And I get a universal answer when I ask that question, whether they're a new couple getting married or a couple that is having marriage problems. And I say, what is marriage? And the answer, I always get the same exact answer is one word. Uh, which means what's coming next is my best guess. It's what I've been taught. It's an assumption. So I say, now, what is marriage? Well, I get answers like this when they finally answer. It's a promise. It's a contract. It's an agreement between two people to love one another till death us do part. Oh, my goodness, that's sentimental, but it doesn't have a whole lot of binding power to it. What, what is marriage? And finally, I have to tell them. It's a covenant. Oh, good. And second question, what's a covenant? And I get that. One word answer, uh, it's, a, it's a contract. It's a binding contract. It's a series of promises. Some people have even told me it's just a piece of paper. Oh, it's not. I got to tell you about a covenant which will change your entire view of everything God did in the Bible, everything. A covenant is something that occurs between two parties that makes them physically related to each other. In other words, what you're looking at here, they just made a covenant, is not a bride and a groom or individuals that are now brought together by a contract. You are looking now at something that we could better characterize as a brother and a sister. When two people get married, when two people get married and make a covenant, or when two people make a covenant in the Bible, it makes them kin once it's been ratified. That's why God made a covenant with Abraham, and though Abraham's children have rebelled against it over and over and over again, God keeps coming back saying, you're mine and you can never drive me away because I will never desert you. Why? Because you are my, for Israel, my wife. God never leaves his wife. That's the deal. That's what a covenant does. It makes two people, two parties, if it's between families, kin. And what they have just done is they have made their families now related to each other. This is why under the new covenant in Christ's blood, we are now brothers and sisters. He's our big brother and God is our father. Does it make sense now? That's the relationship we have. And in marriage, it's the same thing. When you got up in front, those of you who are married, of all of those witnesses, and you made those vows, whether you knew it or not, you made a covenant. Some of you have been divorced. Some of you have been divorced many, many times. And I want you to understand something right now. That Jesus, in the book of Revelation, said something you need to take to heart. He said twice, behold, I make all things new. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's only one unforgivable sin in the Bible, and it's not divorce. But what divorce is, is a death. Let me tell you how this works. Let's pretend you have an eccentric brother. You say, how do you know my brother? <laughs> you have an eccentric brother, and your eccentric brother wins the lotto. Ah! The Powerball. He calls you up and you say, how you doing? He says, I have good news and bad news. The good news, I won the Powerball lottery. I'm now a billionaire. The bad news, you'll never see me again. I bought an island way out in the South Pacific. It's my own. You know how I hate technology. You know how I'm going to get rid of my cell phone. I don't like satellite. I don't like TV. I just want peace and quiet for the rest of my life because I'm eccentric. And I bought this island, and I paid people to stock it and put a house on it and then paid them not to tell anybody where I'm going to be, and I'm going to go there and live for the rest of my life, and your brother does that. And you never see your brother again. Here's my question to you. Is he still your brother? Yes. Why? Because your blood. That's what you're looking at here. When is your brother not your brother anymore? When one of you dies, until death us do part. That phrase, if you said it in your wedding, or if you intend to say it in your wedding someday, came out of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, written about 400 years ago. In 1900, universally in the West, the phrase, until death us do part, went from covenant to sentiment. 
It became something that we intend to do rather than something that must happen. Because a covenant, even in the eyes of Westerners, all the way back to about 1900, they recognized the fact that when two people got married, they were now blood relatives. And it was until death us do part the way it is with any blood relative. That's a covenant. That's what you just saw happen here. That's what you see every time God makes a covenant with someone in the Bible or a group of people in the Bible, and it's until death us do part, and guess what? God never dies. Or if he does, he rises from the dead, okay? <laughs> you get it. So we go back to this. Why don't you guys step out there again for a second? Now, the, he has handed the bride the cup. She took the sip. Take the sip again. She hands it back to him. He takes the sip. Take the sip again. And now everybody shouts. Amen. And then the bridegroom turns to the audience and he says, and I will say it for him, he says, you are now consecrated to me, speaking to his bride, by the laws of Moses and Israel. And then he says, and I will not drink of this cup again until I drink it anew with you in my father's house. When Jesus at the Last Supper took the cup, and he poured it out, and he passed it to his guys, and he said, take this cup, all of you, and drink of it. For this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins of many. Drink it, all of you, for I will not drink of this fruit of the vine again until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Kingdom. Is there a difference? No, there isn't. Because when Jesus said those words, the disciples who presumed that Jesus was going to be a military Messiah like all the other guys that came before him that claimed to be a Messiah, throw out the Romans, rule and reign from Mount Zion with them at his right hand and left hand, and they were going to have power. They didn't know he was planning on going away. And he made a covenant with them the way a bridegroom would make with the bride. And when they heard him say those words, they heard, wedding! Because those words never belonged in a Passover, a Seder, or any other Jewish ceremony except the wedding. That was it. And now you know, even there, he's saying, it's like a wedding. Well, there's more. Oh, oh, one more thing. One more thing. I, I almost forgot to tell you. In Ephesians, uh, you guys know about this verse where uh, it says that uh, Paul speaking, that a man will leave his father and mother and cleave only to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, right? One flesh we interpret in the West as meaning sex. There's the other bold statement I'm making here. But instead, think of it like this. One flesh means that you are now brother and sister. You are now related by blood, one flesh. And that's what the ultimate expression of it was. And then he said, this is a great mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church, bridegroom and a bride. That's covenant. Well, so the last thing that happens is that now that he has made the great declaration, then a family member hands him a veil that he gives to his bride, and his bride puts the veil on at that point, and she will never go outside her house without wearing the veil until their wedding day. Then she will not wear it anymore. But during that time, this veil means I am keeping myself pure for my bridegroom and for my wedding day when my bridegroom comes for me. The veil was a symbol of purity. Bride of Christ, purity matters if you're the bride of Christ. Purity on God's terms, on terms of his word and his covenant with us, on his terms, we keep ourselves pure in a society that is eroding our purity in every way possible. No, you don't have to do that. We have whole new ways of interpreting the Bible and whole new ways of doing things because this is the 21st century. Bah humbug. Not so. It's keeping yourself pure for your bridegroom, bride of Christ, our veil is our purity in this world. And when the world comes along like other suitors might try and seduce her and would say to her, take your veil off. 
Our answer is the same, I will not, because I have seen my bridegroom, and he is magnificent, and he's coming for me one day. I keep myself pure. And when she puts that veil on, all the witnesses shout. Amen. No, 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 they shout. Amen. And they shout one more time. Amen. Because that would conclude the betrothal, but it doesn't conclude the process. So would you give our, our, our helpers up here a hand? They're doing a great job. Thank you so much. And you can sit down now. Now, the hoopah is packed up, and everybody goes away celebrating and singing. The beggars go back to begging. The thieves go back to thieving. The guards go back to guarding. All the witnesses say, wow, that was a nice break from the day, and they go back to their jobs. And everything goes back to the houses, and all the people do. And the bridegroom goes back to his house, and the, what are you guys doing back there? No, no, no hanky-panky. You, you gotta, you gotta, not until you're married. So the bridegroom goes back to his house, and the bride goes back to her house with the family, and they've got something to do. They're not coming together as husband and wife until another ceremony at the end of approximately one year. Why do I say approximately? I'll explain that in a minute. But about that time, during that time, the bride has to get to work. What she gets to work on is her wedding dress. The wedding dress is a magnificent thing that she would wear. It wouldn't be white. It would be layers upon layers upon layers of cloth, which means she's got to work really hard to gather all of this in a very, very needy society. Now, Israel, or the land of Judea at that time, was located on the Silk Road and the Spice Roads, leading in and out of North Africa, Arabia, and going up into Europe and China. All that area. And you can imagine the caravans coming through and what they were carrying. Cloth. Lots of it. To shell all over the world. They would have even known what silk was. They would have known what East Asian people looked like because they would have been passing through the area frequently with the caravans. This is their world. So she can bargain any way she can along with her family to try and get pieces of cloth to be able to put together into something that looks like a woman is wearing a hoop skirt except there's no hoop. It's just all layers of cloth. It must have been enormously heavy. And then her headdress, which she's wearing a short little headscarf there, would have been built up into a very tall thing. She would have had coins from her dowry put around parts of the veil. It would have been amazing. If she would have borrowed jewelry, if they were very poor, tin jewelry. If they were rich, maybe silver, bronze, or, or even gold jewelry, where she would have bracelets going from her wrist all the way up to her upper arm. Can you imagine? Don't fall in a lake. You're going straight to the bottom. You would have had the ladies would have had necklaces that would have hung way down one after the other, layer after layer, including one that even had a vial in it of perfume that was constantly just making the air around her sweet and lovely. And this is what she has to put together, and it's going to take her a full year to do it. Her bridesmaids might be her sisters or her young virgin friends, and they have to have oil lamps. These lamps here are burning oil, Typically olive oil in those days. This is canola oil here today, but hey, you know, it works, right? And, and these are the exact same type of lamps that you hear about in, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 25 with the ten virgins and the oil lamps. These are the lamps right here. And so they've got to make sure they have their lamps ready for that very great moment, filled with oil, charged and ready to go for when the bridegroom comes. Meanwhile, the bridegroom goes home with his family, and he, goes, he begins uh, two huge tasks, especially if he's poor. He's got to put together a huge feast. The feast for all the invited guests. They have to decide who they're going to invite because they can't just invite everybody. They've got to invite family. They've got to invite special friends who might be uh, another part of the village. They've got to get them together. And so he's got to have this huge feast that's going to accommodate them for days, for days, because the feast is not two or three hours like a wedding reception. It's something that goes on and on and on during those times. And then... He has to build a room onto his father's house. And the reason he does this is because once a couple gets married, they don't get an apartment down the road or go off and get a house in the country or something. They come to live at the bridegroom's father's compound because people didn't spread out in those days very often. They would stay together as a family, generations living under one roof or many roofs in one big clumped compound where everything's packed very closely together. And that means that the bridegroom may have to build two or three stories up after that engineering fails and the place collapses. They, they're kind of limited on space. But he's got to build this room. And he's going to spend the whole year putting it together because this is where the nuptials will take place and this is where the bride and the groom are going to live 
for the rest of their lives together in the Father's house. Jesus, at the Last Supper, told his disciples this. You know this. It's in John 14, the beginning of the chapter, where he's just told the disciples horrible bad news. I'm going to be betrayed, and Judas leaves, and he's, and Peter, you're going to deny me three times. No, I'm not. Yes, you are, and you're all going to desert me. And they're very distressed at a celebration like the Passover, which it was a celebration back then. And then he says, but let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many, I knew you were going to say that. The word is literally rooms. What kind of room? Well, you would think if I'm going to heaven, it's got to be a mansion. And that's what the King James translators assumed. They didn't understand the context. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. And I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go there to prepare a place for you, I will come to you and take you to be with me where I am. You know where I'm going. And they didn't. They didn't. But what they heard? Wedding! Jesus is saying, I'm going away. They didn't think he was going away. They're going to figure it out soon enough. But I'm going away until I come back to take you. And while I'm away, I'm going to be building the bridal chamber, as it were. The place where you're going to live with me forever and ever and ever after I come to get you. That's what they heard, but they categorized it someplace else because it didn't fit their view of who they thought Jesus was supposed to be and do. But he was talking about a wedding, and that's what they heard. In my Father's house are many bridal chambers. That's the context. And it doesn't change from that no matter what the translators write. That's the deal. Well, he, the bride works on her, her, her dress. The bridegroom puts the feast together, which takes a long time. He puts the room together, which takes a long time. And then the bridegroom knows and is hearing rumors that the bride, the bride knows, excuse me, not the bridegroom, the bride knows that the, that the bridegroom is coming soon. And you say, well, yeah, when's he coming? The bridegroom, back at his house, finishes up the room. She's getting rumors. The room is done. She's getting rumors. The feast is ready. So she knows the bridegroom's coming soon. So she wears her dress to bed. She sleeps on a straw-filled mattress, probably, just, just some sackcloth over the top of it. But she's got her bridesmaids with her. So when the bridegroom comes in the middle of the night, that she's ready. They dust her off, they straighten her out, they knock the wrinkles out, they fix her makeup. Boy, does she know makeup. Remember, they came out of Egypt, remember? Remember with Moses? They know makeup. The Egyptians knew makeup. She would have worn makeup on her eyes, she would have worn her veil, her hands would have been all painted up with henna. Where do they get that? From India. Where do they get that? From passing caravans. They would have painted the palms of her hands because she's not supposed to do any work. They're going to do it all for her. So she's got to keep that part clean. They would have painted her feet the same way. And then she waits for the bridegroom to come. The bridegroom, in the meantime, he's done. He brings his dad up for inspection. The dad inspects the room. The dad inspects the feast. And the bridegroom says, I want my bride. And the dad says, I'll tell you when. Because unlike Judean weddings and Arab weddings of the region of that time and that era, the Galileans were rebels. And all of Jesus' disciples were Galileans. And they understood the imagery when he was asked, what will the end of the world look like? And he told his disciples, he said, no one knows the day or the hour. Not the angels of heaven, not even the Son, when the Son of Man will come. When they heard that, these Galileans heard wedding. Why did Jesus put it that way? Because for us, the end of the world will not be like horror. It will be like a wedding to him. And he wanted us to remember that, and he wanted his disciples to remember that, that it's a whole different thing for us, his followers. So the son goes to the father. I'm ready. I want my bride. Do you picture Jesus up in heaven at the right hand of the Father going, Father, yes, son, I want my bride. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. No, he loves you. 
He wants his bride. He wants his bride to be with him. He wants to go and get his bride. Jesus is in heaven anticipating coming for you probably more than you're anticipating him coming for you. He wants his bride, but only the Father can tell him when to go. Those people who try and tell you the date when Jesus is coming are jumping through loopholes that they have created because a predictable God is a safe God and Aslan is not a tame lion. God is going to send Jesus back when he's ready. And it's going to be unpredictable except for the season in which we're in. And that's pretty obvious right now. It could be any time when the Father sends the Son back. So the Son goes to bed one night. The bride is sleeping in her clothes, her, her bridal gown. The bridesmaids with her. The lamps ready to be lit and burning. And then in the middle of the night when the bridegroom is in a room crammed in there, small rooms, lots of people, and all of his groomsmen, his friends, his brothers are in there. And the father grabs an oil lamp and he's stepping over all the guys. And he comes up to his son and he grabs him by the shoulder and says, Son! What? Get up. <laughs> Dad! Son! What? Go get your bride. Boing! And he jumps to his feet. <laughs> he's so excited. And the father's got to get out of the way. Guys, get up, get up now. And then the bridegroom grabs his shofar and he runs up to the roof of the house. If he's not already on the roof, people slept on the roof because it's hot back then. It's cool on the roof, right? Grabs a shofar in the middle of the night because that was tradition back then. It wasn't demanded, but it worked. And he would blow this thing to wake up the entire village. This is the alarm clock. What else could there be? And that's also the bride's family, wherever they live, maybe on the other side of the village, it's loud enough for them to hear, it's loud enough for all the guests to hear. And then the bridegroom, leading the guys, charges down the stairs because they would sleep up higher than off the ground. There's lots of reasons for that, but he'd go down the stairs, all the guys following him, they have torches that they would light. They get a litter like what you saw the bride brought in, that, 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 the poles with the chair, and they're going to treat her like a queen by carrying her on this thing. And of course, they have musical instruments, drums and kalils and all of that. And then they rush out into the street, the father holding the gate for all the groomsmen carrying the litter, going out to the bride's house. But they don't go straight to the bride's house. They weave through the streets, serpentining through all the streets <coughs> because the invited guests, they come rushing down from their rooms because they don't want to miss the feast. If they don't get in line, they're not getting into the feast. So they come rushing down. Hey, if you want the imagery on this, what is this all about? It's quite simple. All the people coming down out of the rooms, the invited guests, we talk about the rapture of the church, don't we? The rapture of the church is a side effect of the resurrection of the dead. Never forget that. The resurrection of the dead was the one thing, Old Testament and New Testament, that everybody was waiting for. And if you were alive when the resurrection of the dead took place, that was the rapture. That's the deal. And so down they go, serpentining through the streets, waking the dead, as it were. They're getting in line as they follow this, this parade, rushing through the streets with the bridegroom and all his men shouting, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is what they would say. And the line gets longer and longer and singing and dancing in the streets as the parade moves on. And finally... They come up to the bride's house. The bride's family has heard what's going on. She's leapt to her feet. The women are all knocking the wrinkles and the, and the straw off of her outfit. They're straightening up everything, making sure her makeup's in place. And then they all light their lamps and holding their lamps in bowls. They would have stepped out into the street in the dark, which means they're lit from below. I've seen this one time when I've done this presentation in total darkness where we actually had bowls and brides with the lamps underneath them in a dark corridor. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life, except for my wife. And I, I better say that too. She's not here, but she knows. And, 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 and they're, they're standing out in the street, the bride in the middle, the bridesmaids on each side holding these bowls of light, the families behind them holding torches, waiting for the bridegroom to come. And as he rounds the corner because he's leading the procession, it's a showstopper. Look, there she is, and she's beautiful. And look at the light. Oh, it's glorious. Their lamps are burning. You can see all the spiritual imagery in that. And then along come the guys, and they set the litter down in front of the bride. And the bride steps into the litter. And the bridegroom watches this happen. And then the men lift her off 
the ground and being led by the bridegroom going in as straight a line and as a direct course as possible, no more serpentining through the streets. They carry the bride off the ground, flying her, as it were, to his father's house where all the parade and all the invited guests go inside the compound. Last person comes in. The gate is shut and locked and nobody leaves and nobody comes in for seven days and nights. That's the resurrection of the dead. That's the rapture of the church. That's the end of the world right there. And then, while they're in there celebrating, and they're singing songs and giving blessings upon the, the bride and the groom, perhaps giving gifts to them, and they have their own separate table, and this goes on and on, the bridegroom then takes a piece of bread, a little bite of bread, he dips it in salt, and he's had a package of salt from each family member, each, excuse me, each family, one from one family, one from the other. He pours it together on a single plate, and he stirs it up with his finger. What does that mean? The families are blended together in such a way where you try and sort that out. It'll never happen in a million years. You'll never get it right. The families are blended together and then he dips the bread into it and he puts the bread with the salt on it into his bride's mouth and then he does the same thing. And then he pours that cup again and takes the cup and now he takes the first sip. And then he hands it to his bride and then she takes the sip. And the marriage is now re-ratified. They are already husband and wife. But now it's been ratified in front of the witnesses at the wedding feast. And then the bride and the groom make their escape, and they go off. And I'm sorry, this is pretty bold, but we would think it's weird, and they just went with it. They would consummate the marriage in the bridal chamber and then come out when they're ready as the feast is still going on, and they'd rejoin the feast. Sounds awkward, but it's what they did, and it's what they appreciated. That's a Galilean wedding. But wait, it gets even better. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, this event is described. It's not the only place it's described, but it gives us really the biggest picture of it. When John, after in his vision, he had just seen the fall of the Antichrist's kingdom, John wrote Revelation not entirely chronologically. So be aware that this event could have taken place at other times. He said this. He said, Then I heard, as it were, the roar of a great multitude, like loud peals of thunder and the roar of rushing waters, shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory for the marriage of the Lamb, that's Jesus, Lamb of God, the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, white and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous works of the saints. It was as if you'd done everything right. That's this marriage that we're talking about. But wait a minute, it gets even better. Because I look at that and I say, okay, that tells us what it is, but it doesn't tell us what it really looks like. What does it look like? Now, I remember my wedding, and I know what it looked like. I stood up in front of Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa in 1979 with about 300 people in a room that sat 2,700, and I looked like a glass of milk. I was wearing a polyester, all-white, head-to-toe tuxedo with the ruffles and the whole thing. I weighed 40 pounds less than you see me now. I had hair so long I could reach up my back and grab it. I had a Fu Manchu mustache. And I'm waiting for my bride to show up, and Kathy comes through the back door with her father, the most beautiful bridal gown I'd ever seen in my life, as he's got a veil that comes all the way down in a V to where her hands are clasping pure white flowers on a dark green uh, trim of leaves going almost all the way to the floor. And there's her father in a light blue tuxedo with the dark blue lining 70s, right? With the blue ruffles down the front looking like a WWF wrestler with hot dogs behind his neck. His bald head proudly escorting his daughter down the aisle to meet me with a look in his eye that he is so proud, but don't you dare mess with her, Jay. And he walks her up to the bottom, and I step down the four steps, and I take her arm, and I walk up, and I look in her face, and fireworks are going off in her eyes like Disneyland. It's glorious, and it's beautiful. And I knew that her smile and her eyes were for me. It was a great day. 
one of the best in my life because I have to compare it with other things like getting saved, you know. But what a day. I wonder what it's going to be like for us, the bride of Christ, millions, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of people being brought together to him. He actually tells us. And it's in a place where you wouldn't expect to think about this. And, and I want you to pay special attention to this part because this could be overwhelming if it really sinks in. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, Paul speaks to husbands. He says, husbands, love your wives. Now, I'm going to stop right there. We can go off into a thing on marriage and husbands, how you're supposed to love your wives. Much to your relief, probably, I'm going to cut that part off and just push it aside for a minute. And listen to this. As Christ loved the church, gave himself for her, gave himself for her, cleansing her with the washing with water through the word. The mikvah, by the way, is the word for water, washing. Hmm. Uh, that's that ceremonial cleansing pond. Interesting. Cleansing her with the washing with water through the word that he may present her to himself, a radiant bride, holy, blameless, without any stain or wrinkle. That is the wedding to come. He will present you to himself. How does that work? I don't know. But that's the biggest picture we've got of it right there. But it's even bigger than that, because I want you to think about this for a second. As Christ loved the church, us, Saved people. And gave himself for her. Us. Saved people. That he may present her to himself. Why did Christ love the church? Why did Christ give himself for people? God is bringing people into his kingdom. He wants us into his kingdom. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Everything he does is to bring people home. Everything he does. And you have to ask the question, listen, this is huge. Why did the everlasting God create the universe? Why did he create man and woman? Why did he let them fall? Why did he bring the law in to bring people back? Why did he send his only son to become a man and die for our sins? Why did he do that? That we could lose all of our sins and be able to come face to face with him in holiness? Why did Jesus rise from the dead? Why is Jesus coming back? Not just to set the world straight. He's coming back as a bridegroom for his bride that his bride might be with him forever. The entire reason that we exist, that anything exists anywhere, that history goes from everlasting to everlasting as God made it, is God is bringing a bride to his son forever. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing with water through the word that he may present her to himself, a radiant bride, holy and blameless without any stain or wrinkle. That is the history of all history. The history of the created universe. And the centerpiece, the wedding of all the children of God to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's the way he characterized it. Because he says, I love you that much. I love you just that much. This is why marriage is sacred. It's been desacralized in our modern world in horrible ways. As far as God is concerned and Jesus is concerned, it's entirely sacred. Because marriage is not some sort of a spiritualized mating ceremony. Marriage from the beginning. And if you think about it, in every tribe, ethnic group, country, social system in the world, it all looks almost the same. The same elements are there. The man, the woman, forget about what they're saying today. It doesn't change facts. 
the man, the woman, brought together, presumably for the rest of their lives, and hopefully that's the case, and that they would have kids and there would be a relationship there. That Jesus put it in the hearts of everyone to grease the wheels of the gospel of his love so that marriage is a living, breathing, walking, talking parable of Christ's love for the world and his church and the church's response to him. I take him. I take his cup. The cup that he poured out for me. And that means that the marriage feast of the Lamb, that wedding day to come, is probably God's best day, if you could say it that way. That's a very poor way to say it, but let's just go with it. Jesus' best day, definitely yours. And it's the beginning of all eternity with him for us. And the covenant is good because it's until death us do part and he never dies. And though your body may quit someday, you never die either. That's a Galilean wedding. And that's what Jesus said over and over again. This is the last thing I'm going to say. Some of you might be thinking, wow, this is amazing. But you know, I've done some pretty bad things, or I'm involved in some pretty rotten things. You know, give up on them. And here's why. When Jesus looks at you, bride, he doesn't see somebody blotted or stained. He doesn't see somebody wrinkled or ruined. He sees radiance, because he made you that way. He made you that way. This is why in a wedding and marriage, in relationships between men and women, that marriage outside of a covenant, two people living together, is nothing like Jesus. He made a covenant. I'll never leave you. People that live together do so for one purpose only. If something goes wrong, I can pull out easy with all of the legal entanglements. Tell me I'm a liar. Then you have adultery, fornication, and other types of perversions that work their way into marriage. None of these things are what Jesus does or ever will do on a spiritual basis or otherwise. It's nothing like him, which is why marriage is sacred. Marriage the way he put it. And that's why he said, you are like my bride, and I will be your bridegroom forever and ever. And all the witnesses shout, Amen. Amen. Rob, please come up. Wow. We, you know, we just had a wedding at our house a couple weeks ago, and it was, it was nothing like that. It, two people got together. They talked for about 15 minutes. Justin prayed, and bam, they were married. So we're grateful for, we're grateful for all the helpers. So um, we're grateful for all of you that were able to come today. And, you know, one of the things that we do in the morning time uh, here at the chapel as a pastoral staff is we pray for each of you guys at, and, your, and your marriages. Um, Marriage is so important, and it's so important that we keep our marriages pure and on track. And so consider that, you know, when a marriage conference comes up, go to it. You might say, no, nah, I've been married for 35 years. I don't need to go to that. But it's super important that you are connecting with that person that the Lord has put there with you. So I'd like to close with just a song, if you could stand with me. Um, it's just a song. Uh, you all should know the words. And I'm not really a singer, but, uh, but it, it goes, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King. With what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful for this time that we have together, Lord, and I'm thankful for all that are able to come. Lord, we do lift marriages up to you, Father. We lift each of us up to you, my own marriage and each marriage that's in here. And, and Father, for those that are thinking about marriage, we lift that up to you as well. So, Lord, as we go today, I ask that you would bless our time. Um, 
Help us to bless our spouses. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget your kids. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>